Well, well, Casey, Quinlan, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, this is John Hoban, and what I wanted to do today for the Society of Participatory Medicine's newsletter is to dig in a little bit more on the excellent column in, published in BMC Medicine, which it was a sweet Tuesday last week, uh, Casey, which uh, I can greatly appreciate that. Tell me a little bit about the article in general, and then in particular, what I'd like to drill in for the next uh, minute or two is things, what's reading between the lines? What are the things that you couldn't put in a published journal that you'd like to say here and now? Well, I will say that based on, um, you know, my participation in the long conversation and idea exchange that led to what people will see on the BMC um, medicine site, is a pretty robust discussion where it started with um, Glenn Elwin, who's a doctor who is uh, the guy running, I think he's like in charge of the preferences lab at Dartmouth, mm -hmm. and uh, a group of, uh, and Al, Al Muley, who's another Dartmouth brainiac, um, brilliant, brilliant doctor. And there are, you know, some other um, authors, you can see all of them online, but the, the thing that really had me going, wow, and I sort of had to wake up every once in a while and go, no, you need to contribute to this discussion. Don't just go, wow, Gordon Guyot, the man who codified sort of, you know, the father of evidence-based medicine, the doctor from McMaster University. Anyway, mm -hmm. we started in one place. <clears throat> and this was with an idea that Glenn had that he wanted me to contribute to as sort of a patient outsider writer journo. I mean, obviously, with you know, it, with with some credibility and some uh, you know experience in inside Thunderdome, as I put it, in the healthcare system, but that um, he wanted me to, I guess, sort of be a reality check about like, okay, if we're going to talk about this, and the title, by the way, is trustworthy guidelines, excellent, customized care tools, even better, and the point is to deliver evidence-based practice guidelines that can then become communication tools that a clinician can use with a patient and the patient and the doctor can then work together toward getting to a clinically relevant evidence-based outcome that is what the patient is looking for and aligns with what the clinician knows as the science behind how to fix this, whatever this is. Right. And, you know, it could be anything from cancer to, you know, pick one. But it went through a lot of, uh, it took a long journey, this, this, this paper, because originally, uh, you know, and I, if going back, I'd have to scrub through my notes. I have them all. But it started as a very sort of, you know, healthcare is stupid if they say don't Google it. And that was a little strong. Um, I thought I thought we'd be lucky if we managed to get that published. <laughs> but I was like, okay, I'm I'm down for that. But uh, you know, it, it it moved from there through because I mean I was the only non clinician on the the you know the the author sheet. But I was as interested in watching the conversation unfold amongst the clinicians as I was in contributing to it, at you know from my point of view as a patient and as someone who does not have letters after her name and perhaps sometimes when it comes to really you know deep scientific issues needs a little help okay help me connect the dots here but it really the the point is to get both the clinical community and the patient community and by the way since this is an open access journal everyone can read it um, that you know to get everybody understanding what the conundrum is around what the level of information and understanding is at the doctor's side and then either perceived or actual level of information at the patient side and mm -hmm. sort of bringing that to a point where the doctor isn't you know it's it's like the old joke you know with the the giant you know you the little guy walks up to the giant and says how's the weather up there and the 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 giant spits on him and says it's raining you know um, it's like that's not a, a recipe for great communication or understanding or even anybody liking you. So clinicians know that they need to raise the level of awareness on the patient side. They don't necessarily have to get down here and say, "Oh, well, I don't know anything." And I'm no. I mean, the doctor is bringing a lot of scientific understanding and a lot of you know cognitive knowledge to the encounter. The patient is bringing the problem. 
but the right. patient understands what they want to get out of it. So that's where the you know the guidelines are great, but then when the patient is confronted with choices, how does the clinician help the patient make the choices without driving the conversation? And, um, and you know, it, it really is how do we create a platform and a culture and a sustainable you know flywheel, if you will, of of participatory medicine throughout clinical practice, and this. To me, this article is a really good flag to plant to say this is what this is what we're trying to do. So, um, as a member of SPM, this was kind of in my sweet spot, and to watch it unfold, um, and it's it's somewhat different, or it's markedly different than it was when it started. The message is still the same, but I think it's both more palatable to the clinical side. Um, and it's, you know, eminently accessible to the patient side, so. Excellent. Well, Casey can be reached at Casey at MightyCasey.com. Casey, I want you to stick around. Uh, that was just a short edition, but uh, let's dig in a little bit more right now. Thank you sure. very much. All right, I'm going to stop the recording. No, I'm going to stop the recording and give you a second one. All right, hang on a sec.